Good night, everyone. Your boy is back. Thunder's back up in the building for another Friday evening study discussion in our series, Deconstructing Adventism. We have been having a wonderful time looking at so much of these issues, and I am more than happy to know that these issues have been a tremendous blessing to a lot of you, and you have been watching them, you have been enjoying them, and um, you've been learning quite a lot. And so, and so let me um, wish that everyone had a wonderful day. I'm um, just going to wait a couple of minutes for some folk to get on up in here so that we can um, go through this study uh, tonight. God bless all of you who are on so far. I see a couple of you. I see um, Brother Adrian Anderson. Nice to have you, sir. I think you are from Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, nice to have you, Sister Kathy. God bless you. Thank you so much. You're always a usual faithful person, always on and on time to Sister Mary Clinton as well. Always I'm faithfully hopping on to um, catch these teachings. So grateful for y'all. Um, y'all know the usual. Um, just go ahead and, and share, share this video on your page or in a group or something so that others may be able to, um, to watch them. I see uh, Brother Joey. God bless you, Brother Braxton. I see my boy, CMB, the ambassador. God bless you, Brother CMB. Grateful to have your support as usual. Uh, yes, you're from Melbourne, Adrian. Great, great. Nice to have you, man. All the way from the other side of the world. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining this evening. Um, feel free, guys, to um, tag somebody if you, you think um, they need to be here. If you want them to uh, get some information or better understanding on this issue, go ahead and tag them or share the video. Um, of course, as most of you should know by now, um, the, the YouTube channel is growing nicely. Thank you so much for your continuous support as usual. Um, I do upload the videos on YouTube after I finish do them here. And so you can always go watch them over. You can send them to other people if you want them to, um, you know, grab with the issues, get a better perspective or understanding or the Christian understanding of these things and not so much as just the SDA proof text understanding. So they are there um, for you to use. Of course, you know, I got a shout out to CMB as well. He has a great YouTube channel. Uh, so check him out, calling the ambassador back to Bible basics. He has some great teachings there that you can enjoy as well. He does a variety of things, um, some Adventist issues, some strict biblical issues, just as I do. So check him out. He's a very good teacher as well. And I'm sure you'll be blessed by his presentation. Sister Paulette Lewis, God bless you. Thank you so much for, for joining. I hope everything is okay with y'all. I'm just going to wait for maybe two or three more minutes for some more people to, um, to get on. And then we'll go through this. You see, uh, when the narrative is controlled, it becomes it becomes difficult to actually understand things in perspective and context. And you're going to see why I say that, because when you hear Adventists and others on, you know, food rules, uh, that, that there's a control narrative. There's this proof text in where things are ripped outside of their audiential and historical context. And, uh, they keep repeating the same error so much that every time you look at the text or whatever it is or the issue, that's all you will see. It's like that's all they design in your mind to see. And so if you don't stop and actually look at it from a better perspective or the, the context, you're going to keep missing it. And so that's why I have to, I have to do these. And um, I'm happy that you are not on weighed with them. That means bored, you know, cloyed with them. But um, you want more and you appreciate um, what I'm doing. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to see that. I see Brother Jerry Oliver. God bless you. Thank you so much for um, joining. Of course, CMB, of course, man, I have, to, I have to give respect where it's due. Of course, you are doing a great work over there yourself. And so folk got to know. Many of them may not know, so I got to let them know, hey, I'm not the only one. <laughs> There's a couple of us faithful guys out there and ladies, you know, we are putting in the work and trying to get the information to people so that they can know the facts. I see Reverend Patrick Branton. God bless you, bro. Uh, schoolmate, schoolmate from Bethel, God bless you. Thank you for, for joining. Yeah, you read about that CMB, context kills bad doctrine. That, that's what we've been showing here. Every time, context will always kill the bad doctrines. And in this specific context, SBA bad doctrines. And so um, we got to give them context every time and make it make sense for them so that the nonsensical aspects of Adventism will be seen for what it is. All right, um, whoever else is coming on, they're going to have to catch us wherever we are. So we're going to get on to it and start. Yes, blessings to you, um, Patrick. Blessings to you. So we're, we're looking at the Old Testament food rules in perspective. In our umpteenth, I don't even know what, which um, number we're on now, uh, deconstructing Adventism. But we're just going along. <laughs> we're just rolling with the punches here, guys. Uh, so last week, I had, I had um, broken down for you the, the Adventist health message. And it is um, salvation by diet. And so um, I'm going to continue with this trajectory and now put in context or perspective for you the biblical um, food rules where they have created their salvation by diet health message from. They've ripped and pulled some aspects of these out of context and then have created this elaborate uh, salvation by diet theology on it. Um, but when you look at the scriptural aspect, you're not going to see um, that at all. So we're going to look at the Old Testament food rules in perspectives. Now, it all starts with Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 29 to 30, where after creating Adam and Eve, uh, the human pair in, in verses um, 27 and 28, and God blessed them. He told them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, to fill it up, to subdue it, all of the animals, etc., and then um, verses 29 and 30 tells us that God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. So what we're seeing here is man's original diet. This is pre-sin, before anything went wrong. Uh, man still would have needed to eat. Right? Despite that, he was created in an innocent state. Sin had not affected him on the planet yet. He is still a material creature. He is still substance. And so his physical body needs to be sustained from the material world. And so God gave what we can see here as fruits for man to eat. Vegetables didn't even get in the picture yet. It's just fruits. So the original diet was basically strictly fruits. And I suppose some grains and nuts may fall into this category too. If you notice um, the plants that God refers to, he says every plant yielding seed, that's on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. And so you have plant yielding seed, so the plant must yield some sort of seed. And the fruit tree, uh, the fruit has to have the seed in itself. And so we can deduce quite a number of fruits and plants from this, you know, like, like the mangoes and the oranges and the list goes on. And of course, some fruits are in certain parts of the world and some aren't. But this basically was the basic um, criteria as to what man can eat. Vegetables and legumes and those things are not in the equation. Man did not have those as an original part of his diet in his innocent state. 
in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, the passage continues, You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. So, so what we're seeing here is man is basically given a fruitarian kind of diet, and uh, the animals are given vegetables to eat. So every beast, bird, every swarming, creeping thing, he gives every green plant. And the green plants here are referring to the vegetables. And so initially, animals didn't eat the fruits like they do now, and man didn't eat vegetables like we do now. Initially, fruits and those things were man's food, vegetables were animals' food. How did the supplementation came in? Well, we see in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, how the supplementation came in. It says, And to Adam, and Adam he said, and this is after sin, when God is um, talking with them, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So here we are having now a curse being induced upon the ground, the planet. We are having Adam who is going to experience pain as he lives and toils the ground. And he's going to eat in pain from the ground all his life. Thorns and thistles it should bring forth for you. Thorns and thistles weren't there before, it seems. So now there's a cursed environment and the differences of, of our conditions that's going to produce unfavorable uh, results and stuff. And it says, you shall eat the plants of the field. So here we have now where um, vegetables are being supplemented into man's diet. Obviously, the earth would no longer be in its holy, fruitful state. And so man will not be able to just subsist only of the fruits. And so God supplements his diet with vegetables as well. Plants of the field, the same thing that the animals were given in chapter 1. And verse 19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So he's going to have to toil, he's going to have to sweat, which suggests before he didn't sweat. He didn't have to sweat and work hard to earn his keep, his food. He just pick and eat, but now... He has to work harder because of the curse that's induced in the ground. And the earth will not bring forth fruitfully any longer because of the curse. And so instead of just fruits, he also now has to eat vegetables. And so like cabbage, callaloo in Jamaica, lettuce, and these other vegetables, even carrots. These things weren't man, a part of man's original diet. Even keen. Keen is a grass. It's a, it's, it's a plant or herb of the field. That wasn't a part of man's original diet, but he has to eat all of that now and all of these other, you know, broccoli and kale and all of these other things that we have to eat today. And he says, out of the ground you were taken, dust you are, unto dust you shall return. And so after sin, now we have the supplementation of vegetables, legumes, and other kinds of, uh, stuff being added to man's diet. But notice up to this point, there is no meat. Meat is still not a part of his diet. And so we can logically conclude or assume that up to the time of Noah, when God permitted them to eat meat, and we're going to look at that, everyone was vegetarian. Now, I've watched some videos and watched some presentations where, based on the specific Hebrew word used in um, Genesis 1, 27 and 28, that speaks to subdue, you know, they, they try to split hairs with that and talk about that it means, you know, subdue violently and the killing of the animals, but that's not necessarily so. Just because um, a specific word is used um, in a particular way, place, doesn't mean that it, it, it has that um, connotation. A word's definitional meaning is not always the same meaning connotatively, right? So we have to keep that in mind. And there's no evidence before the flood, before God 
gave Noah the ability to eat animals that humans were eating animals. There is absolutely no um, biblical evidence for that. There are a lot of false prophets, though, like Ellen White, who meander and who take things beyond what Scripture reveals and say that the antediluvians were actually eating meat and subsisting of that and, and raping the animals, amalgamation of man and beast, you know, having sex with animals. And God saw all this wickedness and he destroyed them. Those things do exist, but those things aren't biblical. Those things are either stretching the biblical narrative too much or reading too much false information there and thus create their own narratives that scripture does not reveal. And so up to this point, there is no biblical evidence that man was eating meat. It was just the fruits and the vegetables that God supplement now in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 7, and this is um, in the flood situation, Genesis chapter 7, verses 2 to 3, the Bible says, Of every clean beast you shall take of you by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. So this is when the flood was about to happen and God had to preserve some of the animals so all of them would not die in the flood. And so he instructed Noah, of every clean beast you shall take to you by sevens. And so the male and the female. And so the beasts or the animals that were taken into the ark, uh, the clean ones, there was actually 14 of them. Seven males and seven females, and the beasts that are not clean by two, which means two males and two females. Now, I know you have heard the assumption from Adventists and others that Noah could not have eaten any unclean animal because had he done so, then that animal species would not exist today, like pig, for example. The argument is Noah could not have eaten either sex of the pig whether the male or the female because had he done so because he only took two of them in there a single pair just two of them then it would mean that that species wouldn't exist today but it's 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 one of those hasty conclusions again by not properly reading the text and doing proper research so the beasts that are not clean here by two which means two male and two female so it's actually four pigs would have gone into the ark. And so even if Noah had eaten one of them, there still would have been another to populate the earth. So that argument really falls down flat. And when you actually check the LXX, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this is how it worded as well. Duo, duo, asen, kai, thuli. Two, two, male and female. Right? Uh, so I'm breaking it down for those of you who may find this a little technical. But um, you will not find... In the ancient literature, the Apostolic Church fathers and Jewish commentary really where they thought that it was just a single pig male and a single female went into the ark. But it's actually two male pigs went into the ark and two female pigs went into the ark. So it's actually four of all the unclean animals. So there's a whole lot more unclean animals went into the ark than you may have been hearing over the years. So the clean ones went in by 14s which would have been 14 sheep, 7 male, 7 female, and the unclean ones went in by twos. Two male, two female, four pigs went into the ark. And uh, of the fowls of the air, now the fowls of the air here is very interesting. The fowls of the air, there is no qualifiers for them. There's no modifiers. It's just generally every bird, male or unfemale, clean or unclean, it just doesn't matter. It says the fowls of the air, all of them, you must take in by sevens, which means seven male pigeons went into the ark, seven female pigeons. Seven crows went into the ark, male, seven female crows went into the ark. That's what it says. The birds, there's no qualifiers, all of them by seven. So both the clean and the unclean, they both went in by seven uh, pairs each, seven of each sex. And it was to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. And this makes a lot of sense, especially when, you know, a lot of people today try to deny the, 
the globality of, uh, of the flood. But when we see the amount of animals God allowed Noah to take in the ark, it does make sense that this was a global flood and these animals, uh, their intention was that they spread over the entire world and repopulated as he will command them in chapter 9 that we're going to see uh, clearly. So, so according to this, br brothers and sisters, let me just reiterate so that you can get it because I know for some of you, this may be the first time you are hearing this information. This may be the first time you will have the chance to critically analyze it. According to this, much more unclean animals went into the ark than is popularly believed. The clean went in by seven, seven males and seven females. So the total is 14 and the unclean went in by two, two males and two females. So the total is four. And both clean and unclean birds went in by seven. So that would be 14 clean birds and 14 unclean birds altogether. Now, here's the interesting part. Nothing in Genesis 7 indicate why the animals are designated as clean and unclean. There is absolutely nothing. You could read the entire passage, whether in Hebrew, English, or whatever your language is. You're not going to find anything in there that specifically indicate why the designation of clean and unclean. Nor does anything indicate that no one in his family were eaten animals to have known this. Nothing says that he would have known. He only knew by God's dictation. God dictated to him what was clean and what was unclean, and he took them into the ark. But even then, a reason for those designations cannot be ascertained from Genesis 7. The reason for their clean and unclean classification seems to be in Genesis chapter 8, after the flood. And so let me repeat that briefly. There is no reason for them being designated as clean and unclean in chapter 7. None is given. The reason seems to be given in chapter 8, and you're going to see this very clearly. Genesis chapter 8, verses 18 to 22 say, And Noah went forth, and his sons, and this is when the, flood had, the waters of the flood had subsided, he went forth, his sons, his wife, his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl whatsoever creeps upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. So Noah and everything that were in the ark exited the ark, all of the animals. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast. Did you get that? As soon as he exits the ark, he built an altar to God. This was an act of worship and thanksgiving. And he took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. This is the reason that Noah was instructed to take the animals in as he would have taken them. The reason that there was much more of the clean, especially of the beast, is because he would have needed them for sacrifice. The reason for the classification in Genesis chapter 7 is for sacrificial purposes. It is not for dietary purposes, brothers and sisters. So let, let me read that again. V verse 20 of chapter 8 says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord... And he took of every clean beast, every clean animal, sheep, goat, uh, goat rather, cows, uh, uh, deer. He took of all of the clean animals and he offered a sacrifice to God. And he also took of every clean fowl, every clean bird. So chickens, pigeons, dove, he took of all of those clean ones too. And he offered burnt offerings to God. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again strike any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So God promises that as long as the earth remains, as long as he preserves it, there will always be the seasons, there will always be harvest. There will always be day and night. And he's not going to send a global deluge like he did uh, previously. So this is what we see. So according to this, brothers and sisters, the specific reason we can deduce that Noah was able to take, was uh, given the instruction to take all of those clean animals, was to sacrifice thereafter, to make sacrifice God. I see Patrick is asking, why is the pig referred to as unclean? We're going to get to that. This is, this is why I'm doing this study, putting the food rules in perspective. And so 
just hang around a little more and you're going to get more than enough answers for that question, Reverend Banton. Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 to 14 say, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. So God says to Noah now, he and his children must be fruitful and multiply. Now, there's no indication that Noah had any children after the flood. The Bible does record that his sons populated the earth afterwards, but Noah specifically and his wife didn't seem to have any more children. Nevertheless, God gave them the command. He blessed them and he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish your earth, just as he had done with Adam um, before. I see Sister Helen asking, is the dare clean animal? Yes, dare, moose, um, wild goats, oryxes, a number of them, bison, a number of those um, uh, uh, wild beasts are actually clean animals, a number of them. So yes, it is a, a clean animal. And so God says to Noah, replenish the earth, and he delivers all of creation into his hands, all of the animal world. The beast of the earth, the fowls of the air, everything that moves on the ground, the fishes in the sea, they're all delivered into his hand. Now look at this bombshell instruction. For the very first time, God is going to permit man to eat meat. And notice what he tells him to eat. There is no qualifiers, no distinctions, no separation. He says, eat everything. Verse 3 of Genesis chapter 3 says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. What was Noah allowed to eat? Everything. The clean and unclean distinction, as I already dealt with, was not for dietary purposes because he was not eating meat. As we saw, the most logical deduction, and based on the clues given, for the clean and unclean designation was for sacrifice, according to Genesis 8, 18 to 22. But notice when God is modifying Noah's diet, man's diet, what he says to him, every. And every here, brothers and sisters, is an all-inclusive adjective. It means every. It means all. I know in some context it can mean all within a specific group. But in terms of animals here, God doesn't say every clean beast and every clean fish and every clean bird, etc., he leaves it all open. No, notice the, 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 the progression. After saying that every beast of the earth, which is clean and unclean, are under his authority, every fowl of the air, clean and unclean, everything that moves and every fish of the sea, clean and unclean, are under his dominion and authority, he then says, every moving thing without qualifiers, from, um, um, from this animal kingdom, these animal kingdoms rather, these different stratifications, every one of them I've given to you for food, even as the green herb I've given you all things. So notice, notice, notice here. So that there would be, an, uh, 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 there would be no misunderstanding as to what God is referring to. He says, the same way I gave you every green herb, the plants of the field, etc., to eat, I'm now also giving you every species of animal. You can eat them now. Prior to this, there's no evidence that they were eating animals. And when God gives them the authority to eat animals, he says you can eat everything, anything you want you can have. With this exception though, verse 4, flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat of it. And so... This would include raw meat or the blood itself. You must then eat. You must make sure it's properly killed. You must make sure it's properly cooked to eat it. But in terms of a specific animal that is off limits to him, God does not say that. He gives him authority to eat all of them. And this ban here on the consumption of blood starts from Noah, and therefore it's applicable to all who came after Noah. And so it would apply to all humans. And we see in, 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 in the law for the Jews, it's banned as well. In the New Testament, there's also regulations about that as well. For example, in the law in Leviticus, Leviticus 3.17, that is also banned. Leviticus um, 
17, 14, 19, 26, and Deuteronomy 12, 23, blood should not be consumed. God puts a ban on that. And the reasons he give, the life is in it, and it's the blood that makes atonement for sin under the old covenant sacrificial system. And so here God gives Noah and his family permission to eat everything without exception. Just as they were given every green plant to eat, they can now eat every beast, every fowl, every fish, and everything that moves. They had the liberty to eat whatever they wanted with the exception of eating blood. It is because of this that every nation and people group that were birthed out of Noah's children, and you can look up the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, you'll see who his um, children had and the nations that were birthed out of them, that they historically ate everything and those countries generally eat everything or whatever they want to this day. It's because of this why all of the non-Jewish countries and civilizations of the world, present and past, when we observe them anthropologically and when we look at the archaeological facts about them, these people ate everything indiscriminately, whatever they wanted to. It's because this is what God instructed Noah and his sons. And they passed this tradition on to their children and it kept on getting replicated to this very day. Even with the patriarchs of the Israelites, they ate everything indiscriminately. The Jews actually believe. The patriarchs ate all of those things indiscriminately before God gave Moses the law for them. So even Jews, when they study the law, they understand and accept this. And so all of these wild assumptions and, 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 and arguments of Advent is really fall down flat in light of the contextual and historical facts. Even the Jews who read their Bible in Hebrew for centuries upon centuries, for millennia, they don't come to the conclusions that Adventists come on these things. They accept that um, Noah and all of these other uh, peoples and the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and you name it, they ate pig and all of these different creatures. Uh, the Levitical rules were not applicable to them. Even the Jews would admit this. They'll admit to that they didn't keep the Sabbath, but that's another, that's another issue. That's for another discussion. I'll check out the videos that I've done on that already. And so... This is what it was up to the patriarchal period. Now, when we survey Leviticus and Deuteronomy on food rules, brothers and sisters, the main reason that God gave the Israelites the food rules was for ceremonial purposes. They were to separate Israel from the Gentile world and to show them the separation that sin brings. This is why the food rules were given. So, Patrick, I hope your question is being answered now, and I'm about to answer it in, in uh, in depth a little more sin brings separation from god isaiah 59 verse 2 tells us your sin have separated between me and you uh, you and your god sin brings separation sin makes us unclean therefore uncleanness brought separation from god and god typified this in having unclean israelites be separated from the holy covenant community until they were clean again and then can return to the covenant community. Ellen is saying the Jews don't eat pork, though that's true. The Jews don't eat pork because, again, they are under the law. That's the covenant that was given to them, Helen. But they accept that their forebears, their forefathers, ate those things because they did not have the laws that they currently have. That's the big difference, and that's what I'm trying to get you all to understand. The Jews understand that the law came in at a specific juncture, and it applied specifically to them and anyone who would want to be a part of their covenant community. But outside of that, the rules did not apply. And so their forefathers did not abide by the food rules that they have. They, they recognize that because they are children of Noah. And Noah did not have those rules. And so that is the big difference. And so when you look at the fact that they don't eat pork and certain things today... You can't read that back into Genesis and their forefathers because they already explain and understand that they didn't have those at that time. You have to structure them within the confines of the Sinaitic Covenant and the food rules that God gave at that time, which would be in Leviticus 11 and various other places, as I'm about to show now. And so the Jews don't eat pork now. It's perfectly understandable and it makes sense based on when they had the law. 
and therefore bears eating pork is no issue because they understand that their forefathers did not have the law and therefore certain things weren't expected of them. So that's why it is the way uh, it is now. In Leviticus chapter 5, verses 2 to 3, we read, If someone touches anything unclean, a carcass of an unclean wild animal, or unclean livestock, or an unclean swarming creature, Without being aware of it, he is unclean and guilty. And so carcass of unclean animals made Jews unclean. It made them guilty. They committed an offense where the holiness code was concerned. Or if he touches human uncleanness, any uncleanness by which one can be defiled without being aware of it, but later recognizes it, he is guilty. Now when you read through Leviticus, you will see the plethora of things that made Jews unclean. I'm talking about after having sex, married couples are unclean. Um, in Leviticus chapter 15, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 10, if a man has a nocturnal emission, wet dream, for those of you who, who may think that's too big of a word, if a man has a wet dream, he wakes up in the morning, he realizes he had, a, he, had, he had a wet dream. He is unclean until the evening. He has to be separated from the covenant community, from the camp. Go somewhere outside of the community. Wait till the sun goes down, then he returns. He bathes himself, washes his clothes. The priests examine him. Then he's able to return to the covenant community. That's how these laws are regulated. Women who are menstruating were unclean. You touch a dead body, you were unclean. Uh, you had any sort of bodily discharge, you squeeze a zit, you're, you're bleeding, whatever it is, you are unclean until the evening. And you have to be separated from the community. Sun, when the sun set, you return, go through the ritual, and then you are clean again and can come back in the community. This is what these, the holiness code, basically, the clean and unclean food rules that were a part of the holiness code that um, God intended to teach the Jews. This is what's going on here. Nothing to do with health. Some of them um, secondarily had health aspects to them, but their primary purpose and reason was not for health. In Leviticus chapter 7, verses 19 to 21, here's what it says. Flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. So if you have a clean animal and you're about to eat it, and it touches something unclean, you mustn't eat that You mustn't eat that meat. That's what it's saying. It shall be burned with fire. All who are clean may eat flesh. So everyone who is clean can eat animals. But the person who eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offering, while an uncleanness is in him, that person shall be cut off from his people. So you see what's going on here? If somebody is unclean, Let's say you just copulated with your wife. You had a wet dream or anything of that sort. And you eat the sacrifice of the Lord. God said you should be cut off from your people. That means you are to totally be severed from the covenant community. Whether you become an exile or you were to be stoned to death or you were to just have no part of the covenant community, this is what God says. Again, God could do this, brothers and sisters. Because these laws were meant to impress upon the people the holiness of God and the separation that sin brings. That's what is happening here. And it says, if anyone touches an unclean thing, anything that is unclean, whether human uncleanness or an unclean beast or an unclean detestable creature, and then eat some flesh from the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offering, that person shall be cut off from his people. And so if you touch anything unclean, and then you come in the tabernacle service or the offerings and you would eat anything holy from the Lord, you'll be cut off from the covenant people. Are you seeing the purpose for these food rules? Well, if you're not, let's look at it more deep in Leviticus and see what it teaches. Now, I'm quite sure those of you who have heard Adventist preachers go to their crusades and read their literature, they never contextually break down Leviticus 11 or go through it. They never do that. They only stop at the specific verses they want, especially from verses 1 to 8, where they itemize, you know, the, the, the camel, uh, the pig, and this and that is unclean, and then they go to the others. 
but they don't take the time to break down why this is so, how these unclean creatures should be regulated, touching them or whatever else have you, because they're not interested in any of that stuff. Their prophet has given them the rubric by which they must work, and that's all they do. They don't care about contextual understanding of scripture and the facts. They only care about hunting down pieces of evidence so that they can use to prop their false ideas and assumptions. That's all. But when you look at Leviticus 11 in context, as I'm going to do right now, your mind will be blown away at the things that you're going to see. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 to 12. Let's look at that section. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel. Notice who? The people of Israel. Not any other nation, the people of Israel. When you're reading scripture, you must read in context. Who is speaking to whom? The instructions that are being given. I, I mean, there are so many things you must consider. The who, what, when, where, how, and why of contextual exegesis. You must look at even topography if necessary. Uh, uh, audience. Politics, a lot of things to make sense of what Scripture is saying and to not read false ideas into Scripture. So speak to the people of Israel. The specific audience here is the people of Israel. Saying, these are the living things that you may eat among all the animals on the earth. So before the Israelites, before this covenant here, everyone could have eaten anything, whatever they want. Watch why God specifically gives them these rules. These rules are specifically, give, specifically given to separate them from the rest of the world. And we're going to see that. We don't have to guess it. We don't have to read anything in there. The Bible will interpret itself and tell us what is going on. So speak to the people of Israel. Every living thing that moves uh, among these animals that move you may eat on the earth. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven footed and choose the cud among the animals you may eat. So the criteria is it must part the hoof, it must be clubbing footed, it must chew the cud, you could eat it. And when you look at the beast and the animal kingdom and you study them, you will see which animals do this. They must ruminate, they must part the hoof, and they must chew the cud. That's what chewing the cud here is ruminate. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part the hoof, you shouldn't eat. So, so... There are some that will have one criteria, but they won't have all the criteria. So God says, you know, they can seem confused and so don't, don't eat them. So he says, among these, you may not eat. The camel, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, it's unclean to you. Who is it unclean to? To you, the Israelites, not to the other Gentiles around you, not to the peoples around you, to you. So Israelites didn't eat camel. Because it doesn't part the hoof. They mustn't eat it. But other peoples ate camels. Even Islam, that abides by a lot of these food rules of the Jews, they eat camel. Camel is a clean creature for them, interestingly. Uh, and the rock badger, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, it's unclean. So the rock badger, the coney, they chew the cud, they ruminate, but they don't part the hoof, it's unclean to you. Not to me, Haitian, Bahamian, Jamaican, LC. Mm -mm. Not to J Jamaicans, not to Americans, to you, 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 the Israelites. That's what the text says. The here, the here is the rabbit, those family. It chews the cut, it doesn't part the hoof, it's unclean to you. You mustn't eat it. Others can't eat it, but not you. And watch, I'm, I'm not squeezing anything into the text here. I'm going to show you all of this. It is saying it, and I'll show you otherwise where it says it too. And the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven footed, but it does not chew the cud, it's unclean to you. So the previous three that they couldn't eat, uh, they chewed the cud, but didn't part the hoof, so you can't eat it, Israelites. But the pig here, the pig is actually cloven footed, part hoofs, but it does not chew the cud, so you, Israelites, mustn't eat it. You shall not eat any of their flesh, you shouldn't touch their carcass. They are unclean to you. So you see in here what he's saying to the Israelites? You mustn't eat their meat. You mustn't touch their dead bodies. They're unclean to you. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. And so he, this is, these are the land creatures now. Explain them and few exceptions. And then these are the creatures in the waters. 
whatever has fins and scales, whether in the seas or the rivers, you may eat. So for the sea creatures, he doesn't name any animal. He just gives the basic criteria. They must have fins and scales. If it doesn't have both, then don't eat it. That's the criteria that is given. Anything in the seas or the rivers that does not have fins and scales, or the swimming creatures in the waters, and of the living creatures that are in the waters, it is detestable to you. They must be held in abhorrence. It has nothing to do existentially with the creature's biological makeup, its habitat, its diet, none of that. It, they just must hold it in execration because God says so. That's, that's all. Because God says so and he wanted to be that which separates them from the rest of the world around them. Other scholars believe, scholars also believe that the reason that some of these animals were forbidden for Jews is also because the Gentiles... Around them, the Hittites and all the pagans were offering these to their gods. And so God didn't want his worship to be contaminated with them and the Israelites to get involved in idolatry. That is true to a certain extent, but it's not entirely true. Because Gentiles were indiscriminate, not only in what they ate, but also in what they sacrificed to their gods. When we get to the New Testament teaching on this, you're going to see this. The Gentiles offered fish to their gods, they offered dogs, they offered everything. In Isaiah 65 and 66, when it talks about eating mouse and pig in the garden and offering sacrifice to God, that's what is being condemned here. Because those were used in sacrificial offerings to pagan deities. And so God is rebuking the Jews in that context, worshipping the dead in the graves, in the tombs, etc., and he is rebuking them for partaking of their sacrificial pagan meals afterwards. That is what Isaiah 65 and 66 is talking about. It's not saying as Adventists believe that God is going to destroy Christians for eating pork when Jesus returns. No, he's actually condemning their idolatrous practices in Isaiah 65 and 66, which involved the sacrificial offering of pig and mouse and other things to the gods and then eaten of them. Now, the big issue there is that not only were these things unclean for the Jews based on what God stipulated, but it's also the problem of idolatry. They were offering him as sacrifices to the gods and partaking of that as well. That's what Isaiah 65 and 66 is uh, condemning. It's not saying that God is going to kill Christians at the end of the day when Jesus returns because we eat pork and steak, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Not steak, rather... um shellfish and other uh, unclean animals. Those passages have nothing to do with believers, strictly for the Jews under the Old Covenant system. And so where the rivers and the water creatures are concerned, what can be eaten, they must uh, have fins and scales. If not, they are detestable. You shall regard them as detestable. You shall not eat of their flesh. You shall, you shall uh, detest their carcass. You must, they mustn't even touch them. Everything in the waters that does not have fins and scales is detestable to you, the Jews. So what we're seeing here, brothers and sisters, is very clear as to what, is God, what God is communicating to them about these creatures. Let's continue with verse 13 onward. Birds and insects. And these you shall detest among the birds. So these are the things that they must then eat among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are detestable. The eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the night hawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl, the cormorant, the short-eared owl, the barn owl, the tawny owl, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron of any kind, the, ho the hoopoe, and the bat. All winged insects that go on all fours are detestable to you, yet among the winged insects, that go on all fours, you may eat those that have jointed legs above their feet with which to hop on the ground. Of them you may eat, and then he's explaining what kind of insects they can eat now. The locust of any kind, the ball locust of any kind, the cricket of any kind, the grasshopper of any kind, you may eat. But all other winged insects that have, that have four feet are detestable to you. So the birds and the insects, he explains clearly. Now, if you notice, in our Western culture, we don't eat grasshoppers and locusts and those things. We just kill them, yuck, yuck, and, and, and kind of thing, and scorn them. 
but biblically they are clean. And guess what? When the Bible says John has died in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that his diet was locust and wild honey. This is the locust here, grasshopper and the locust family. That, that's what John ate. And people in Middle Eastern countries, they eat locusts as a stable part of their diet. They make it a variety of ways. They fry it and they honey it up and they eat it. Now, hopefully, when I visit one of those countries one day, I would love to have that. I would love to taste it. But in my Jamaican culture, Haitian Bahamian culture, we don't, we don't have them. And so I've never eaten them. But biblically, they are clean. And we see all the other birds that are unclean to them, uh, etc. So the Jews mustn't eat those. And these other insects, like ants, they mustn't eat ants. And cockroaches and, and centipedes and millipedes, they mustn't eat them. But like locusts, grasshopper, crickets, and those in, 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 in those families, they were able to eat. Now, let's get more into the passage. We're going to look at now cross-contamination, separation, and the treatment of unclean vessels. I tell you, brothers and sisters, you would not see people who hold to these rules, especially non-Jewish Sabbatarians, go in-depth into these things. They're not even consistent in keeping and practicing these things. They just extract the distinctions Hold on to them, claim that they are keeping the food rules, and they ignore everything else. But where the food rules are concerned, they had to keep all or nothing. And guess what? The temple was also involved, and the priest in there keeping these things. Because if they're unclean, they must be separated from the covenant community. Then at sunset, they must return, take a ritual bath, wash their clothing, be inspected, and then return to the covenant community. So all of this involved a lot of ceremonies, brothers and sisters. It's not just the mere lip service that Adventists pay to the health message. It, 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 it wasn't that simple. <laughs> These things were, were, were executed in such way that a lot of rituals were involved. They were ceremonial stuff, brothers and sisters. And they were meant to teach Israel ceremonial separation. This is what sin does. This is what the Bible is showing us. Now let's look at verse 24 onward. And by these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches their carcass shall be unclean until the evening. Whoever carries any part of their carcass shall wash his clothes, be unclean until the evening. So you see I'm not lying and making things up. These are the regulations for these creatures. Every animal that parts the hoof but is not cloven footed or does not chew the cut is unclean to you. Everyone who touches them shall be unclean. You touch them, you will be unclean. All that walk on all paws among the animals that go on all fours are unclean to you. And so like bears and dogs and cats and lions and those kinds of animals that have paws and walk on them, God says they're unclean to you, the Jews. Not to everybody else, to you, the Jews. And these are unclean to you among the swarming things that swarm on the ground. So creatures that swarm on the ground, the mole rat, the mouse, the great lizard of any kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the lizard, the sand lizard, the chameleon, these are unclean to you among all that swarm. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until the evening. And anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be broken. Did you hear that? If any of these creatures touch any vessel when they're dead, you should break up that vessel. Which advent is you ever see abide by this rule here? Which of them? Name me one. I never followed it. I, I, I don't ever recall doing this. If they fall on your table, you should break it up. If they fall on the TV, you should break it up. That's what this is saying. If the dead body falls on anything, you shall break it. Whether it is an article of wood or a garment or a skin or a sack, any article that is used for any purpose. God makes no exception here. Whatever it is that the dead body falls on, that should be broken up, that should be burned, it should be mashed up. It's unclean. It must be put into water. And it shall be clean until the evening. Okay, so those that can wash, 
you can wash them. Not just wash it and dry it. And uh -uh, it says you have to soak it in water until it's evening and then it shall be clean. If any of them falls into any earthen vessel, earthenware vessel and all that is in it shall be unclean and you shall break it. So if, <laughs> if that animal falls on any earthenware, you got to break that vessel and all the contents of that vessel are also unclean. It can't use again. God was serious with these rules. These Adventists won't be around here proud and elitistic and arrogant and we keep the law utter rubbish. Y'all stop fooling yourselves and try to read the Bible properly and if y'all can follow these laws, y'all better erect temple and find priests and all these things to keep these laws. But they, this, 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 this subjective extraction y'all do to boost y'all pride and y'all arrogance and claim to be keeping all, y'all better have several seats. Go sit down somewhere. Wanna better go sit down because y'all aren't even coming close to keeping these biblical rules of clean and unclean creatures. Any food that could be eaten on which water comes should be unclean. So, so if it falls on your food, it's unclean. And all drink that could be drunk from every such vessel should be unclean. Even if it's a drink you 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 about to drink, it's unclean. Everything on which any part of the carcass falls should be unclean. Whatever it is the carcass falls on, even if it's the ground. If it's in your living quarters, it's unclean. This is what scripture is saying. So if you're going to take these food rules serious, you need to take the regulations of these food rules serious as well. You can't just sit on and prod like a peacock and sit on your pedestal and claim that you're better than the rest of the body of Christ because you abide by the distinctions while ignoring 95% of the rules that go along with these distinctions. What kind of nonsense is that? What kind of nonsense is that? But it's exactly what would y'all do, Adventists? And then y'all y'all beat y'all chest, y'all beat y'all gum all day. When y'all and y'all captured audience in church or wherever, y'all gloat and proud and, and behave badly. We are keeping the law. We keep the food rules. Where? Which food rules? Which ones? Point to me one of y'all who are keeping a single of these food rules. Not a single one. Y'all only fooling yourselves, but y'all can't fool me and y'all can't fool God. So y'all better stop playing around and get serious. Verse 36 says, Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern holding water should be clean. Now, a spring or cistern, because the water is constantly moving, there's a lot of sense there why um, the carcass wouldn't defile it because it, it's not stationary. It's constantly moving, so it's going to take away the contamination. It's going to purify it. But whoever touches the carcass in them shall be unclean. If it's a stationary water, it's unclean. And if any part of their carcass falls upon the seed, green that is to be sown, it is clean. But if water is put on the seed and any part of their carcass falls on it, it's unclean to you. These rules are very clear. Now check this out, brothers and sisters. Do you know that even the clean animals that Jews could have eaten, could also make them unclean? Do you know that chicken, do you know that, that cow and deer and goat and those clean animals and sheep could make Jews unclean as well? Let's read the text. That's why I'm taking my time to contextually break it down for you. So that when these Adventists try to harass you, with their, with their Frankenstein health message, you can easily slap them with the biblical facts and tell them, take away, your, take away yourself. For those of you who don't understand the Jamaican part, what that means, get out of here. <laughs> take away yourself. Get out of here. <laughs> Verse 39 and 40, notice what it says. If any animal which you may eat dies. So if there's an animal they could eat, like cow, goat, sheep, deer, moose, and those animals, if it dies, whoever touches its carcass shall be unclean until the evening. So even the clean animals could have made a Jew unclean. When the animal is dead, those who handle it, or if it died naturally and they handle it, they too are unclean until the evening. Whoever eats of its carcass shall, be, shall wash his clothes 
and be unclean until the evening. So if you find an animal dead and you eat it, you're unclean until the evening. That's what he's saying here for the Jews. Whoever carries the carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. So for example, you're a farmer. You wake up one morning and you find your chicken dead, your cow, your goat or whatever. Those clean animals, if you, you pick up the carcass to go bury it or to go throw it away or even to, to take it to, to the market to sell. And you're going to see this. this I saved this bombshell passage for last to show you how Adventists have no clue of, of what these food rules were about. Yes, roadkill. <laughs> roadkill. <laughs> right. They have no clue what they were about. Even the clean animals could have made Jews unclean. And so if you pick up the carcass and you take it to go bury it, to go sell it, or you, you eat it personally, because they could have. God says you'll be unclean. If you eat it, touch it, lift it, carry it away, you'll be unclean as well until the evening, separate from the community. When the sun sets, you return, take a bath, wash your clothes, voila, you're clean again. Pure rituals, brothers and sisters. And the fact of the rituals also reveal that these have nothing to do with health. I mean, just think of it. You eat pig, you eat a dead cow or whatever, and you're declared unclean, unhealthy. Because Adventists and Dr. Samuel Bakioki and even today, um, the late Dr. Samuel Bakioki and all Adventists today, when they talk about these clean and unclean rules, for them, unclean means unfit for human consumption. That's how they redefine unclean. And so eating these things made you uh, 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 eating these things made you unclean, right? And so how do we become clean again? How do we become healthy again? If it's about health, you mean to tell me after you ingest these animals, all you got to do is just wait, separate from your family or the covenant community or, or the church community. And then when the sun down, you take a shower, you wash your clothes and then you're healthy again. Is that how we become healthy when we eat unhealthy stuff? Absolutely not. But this is the ritual given for them to become clean and in Adventist redefinition, healthy again, biblically. Brothers and sisters, if you follow their argument logically, it doesn't even make sense. It does not make sense. When they ate these things or touched them, they became unhealthy. According to Adventist redefinition, separate from the community, sundown, return, Take a bath, wash your clothes, you're healthy again. And so those of you who want to eat your pork but have scruples, you, you ain't got nothing to worry about. All you got to do is follow this biblical criteria here. All this, these biblical um, ordinances and guidelines. If you are fearful of being unclean or unhealthy or whatever the case is, have your pork. Whatever it is, have it. Have your shellfish. And all you have to do thereafter is wait till the sun sets after you would have separated from people, if you're willing to go through that. Um, take a, sh a cold shower or maybe a hot one if you like to deal with hot water. Wash the clothes you have on and then come back in the covenant community. Problem solved. And guess what? You can repeat this process every day. <laughs> every day you can do this. Brothers and sisters, they, these rules had nothing to do with health. Strictly ceremonies that taught separation. The separation that sin brings. Strictly ceremonies that God put in place to distinguish between Israel and the rest of the Gentile world who were actually eating those things. That's what's going on here. Let's continue. Verse 41 through to the end. Every swarming thing that swarms on the ground is detestable. It shall not be eaten. Whatever goes on the belly, like snakes and Komodo dragon and those others, or whatever goes on all four, whatever has many feet, centipede and all these other creepy crawlies, any swarming thing that swarms on the ground, you shouldn't eat, for they are detestable. They shouldn't eat them, but if they eat them, they would just be unclean. That's it. They're not going to drop down dead, unless it's a poisonous one, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's just normal, natural, so they can eat them and go through the rituals, they're clean again. And by the way, by the way, let, let me show you how seasonal. Let me take you all a little deeper. 
to show you how Jews did not consider these things to be health issues. And they could not keep them properly outside of the Holy Land. When soldiers go to war, Jewish soldiers, soldiers, where the Halakha was concerned, the Halakha was a, um, it's an extra biblical Jewish writing that talks about, you know, their walk, stuff that are not clearly said and stated in scripture, that the rabbis, etc., give commentaries on and the Talmuds too. Um, they uh, give further instruction. In the Jewish Halakha, when soldiers go to war, because they are outside the Holy Land, they are not under the kosher laws. They can actually eat pig without any compunction. They can eat whatever they get their hands on because where Jews are concerned and we're going to see, every land outside of the precincts of the Holy Land are automatically unclean. All Gentile territory is automatically unclean. <laughs> Taking y'all a little deeper with this thing. And so when they are outside the Holy Land, they can eat these things, especially soldiers at war, to save their life. They can eat whatever they find. And when they are coming back in the covenant community after war, of course, they go through the rituals. The ritual bathing and all that they had to go through and washing their clothes, etc. Clothing, etc. And so God says, you mustn't eat these. You shall not make yourself detestable with any swarming thing that swarms, and you shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. Now here's the reason that God gives for these. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I'm holy. So God is saying here the main reason that I'm giving you these food rules and all of these rituals is for holiness is for separation and consecration and setting yourself apart just as I'm set apart. God is set apart from the gods of the world, the nations around. And so he says, you need to practice these rules and eat this way so that you too can be set apart. This is what's going on here, brothers and sisters. It continues, I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall be therefore holy for I am holy. Holiness simply means to be set apart. You should be set apart as I'm set apart. You should be separated as I'm separated. This is the law about the beast and the bird and every living creature that moves through the waters and every creature that swarms on the ground. To make a distinction between the unclean and the clean, between the living creature that may be eaten and the living creature that may not be eaten. God is saying all of these rules about foods that I'm giving you are holiness. For separation, for distinction between you and the nations around you. To be ceremonially separated from everybody else. And at a deeper level, they show how sins separate us from God and from each other. This was the basic theology behind the food rules. Let me prove it further. Leviticus chapter 20 verses 22 to 26 and this is after God gave all of these, now Leviticus 11 and coming on um, to, the, to the sexual ethics in chapter 18 and 20 and the priests and all of that. Here's what God says as to why he gave them those rules. You shall therefore keep all of my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where I'm bringing you to live may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nation that I'm driving out before you, for they did all of these things and therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit the land and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. Very prosperous. That's what this terminology means. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. Did you hear it again, brothers and sisters? These rules are given so that you won't do what the nations were doing. This is what they were doing. And I want you to be distinct. I want you to be different. I want you to be separated. Nah, nah, nah. Adventists may say, well, 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 we do them to be different too. But no, no, no. That's not required of you any longer. You're not under this old covenant. That covenant is gone. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that. So God says, I brought you out of Egypt to be your God, for you to be my people. And I have separated you from the peoples of the world. You shall therefore separate 
the clean beast from the unclean, the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which uh, the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. Separation is repeated so many times in this verse. And that's exactly what God is showing them through these food distinctions. Verse 26 says, You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples. Here it is again. Separated you from the peoples, so that you should be mine. God gave the Israelites several external ceremonies to practice, to be separating signs or walls between themselves and the nations around them. There were, there were four of them that I could think of right away. There was circumcision in their in their um, male member for males. Females didn't have to be circumcised. They're considered to be naturally circumcised. And also, the circumcision of the father or the male figure in the home covers the females. That's where their theology is um, um, concerned. And so you have six circumcision. You have the food rules here that separate Israel from the rest of the nations around it. You have the Sabbath and the feasts. You, you find this in Exodus 31, 12 to 17. You find uh, Ezekiel 20, 12 and 20, 20, where it specifically says that this is the reason for the Sabbath. And you also have the zitzi or the blue tassels that they wore at the edges of their garments. And you can find this in Numbers chapter 15, verses 35 to 36, where God told them, you ought to wear these blue tassels so that you may remember the law of the Lord your God and his commandments to do them and also be separate from the nations. These are the four external observable things the Jews did to stand out from the rest of the world. That's all it was about. Now, as I close, brothers and sisters, as I close, let me drive this point home. The clean and unclean food distinctions did not apply to Gentiles. Did you hear what I say? The clean and unclean food distinctions and regulations did not apply to Gentiles. Leviticus 22 verse 8 say, He, that is re referring to a priest, shall not eat what dies of itself or is torn by beast, and so make himself unclean by it. I am the Lord. So here God says the priest mustn't eat roadkill. He mustn't eat what other animals have killed. He mustn't eat an animal he sees dies naturally. He says, it's going to make you unclean. Don't touch it. Here's what God say about the Jews now as a nation and also the Gentiles with respect to the same rule. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21. Here's the bombshell passage that show that Adventists have no clue <laughs> what these food rules were about. These food rules were never about health at all. If they were about health, then on this passage, this text alone, we can charge God with being a monster, a racist, or whatever as you want to call him. Hear this carefully. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21. You, and this is talking to all the Israelites. You shall not eat anything that has died naturally. You shall not eat anything that has died naturally. You may give it to the surgeon up. Who's within your towns? Did you catch that? The Israelites couldn't eat an animal that died naturally or that is torn by wild beasts, but they can give it to an alien or a stranger in their midst that he may eat it or you may sell it to a foreigner for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Did you catch what this passage is saying? The Israelites could not eat any animal, any clean animal that died by itself. But God says they can give it to the foreigners in their midst that they may eat it. Or they can sell it to not lose that profit. They can take it to market and sell it to the Gentiles and the foreigners around them. Even the alien workers they have in the houses, they could sell it to them that they may eat it. But the Israelites themselves can't eat it. Brothers and sisters, if these food rules had anything to do with health, God would have been a moral monster. Because physiologically, 
Jews and Gentiles have the same alimentary canals. Alimentary canals. Jews and Gentiles have the same physiological makeup. The same way foods affect Jews, it would affect Gentiles as well. So if this had to do with health, God would have been a moral monster. But as I said, we don't have to end up with this dilemma with God. We don't have to charge God with being a moral monster because these Levitical food rules had nothing to do with health. Ceremony is about separation and holiness and that's it. I'll read the text again. God says, you must not eat anything that has died naturally. You may give it to the surgeoner who is within your towns. So the resident aliens in their towns, they can give those animals to them that they may eat it. Or they can sell that animal to make a profit to not lose that profit. They can sell it, but they can't eat it because they are a holy people to the Lord their God. This text blows the Adventist food distinctions out the water and proves they have no clue what these rules were about. The Jews couldn't eat the animal, but they could give it to the alien among them. They could sell it to not lose that profit, but they themselves couldn't eat it. How could God command them to do this if these things were about health? Of course it's not about health. Romans chapter 3 tells us that he's not just the God of the Jews, he's the God of the Gentiles too. And so even the Gentiles who don't know him worshiping false God, they are still his people by creation. And they are his by the redemption he's provided in Jesus Christ. So he's the God of the Gentiles as well. But here he's saying, give the Gentiles that. Let them eat it. Sell it to them. Let them eat it. But you can't eat it. Again, it has nothing to do with health. If it did, we could charge God with monstrosity and favoritism and racism here. But again... There's no need for that because the food rules had nothing to do with health, but mere ceremonies. As I close, brothers and sisters, let me, let, 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 me, let, me, let me bring it home now. We'll continue with the New Testament and what it teaches on this matter. But let me close this one here. It is because Gentiles ate everything indiscriminately and were not under Israel's food rules. That Jews considered Gentiles to be dogs and unclean creatures. Gentiles were considered to be in a perpetual state of uncleanness by virtue of their diet. Their houses were considered unclean. Their clothing were unclean. Whatever they touched and handled was unclean. Even their very lands were considered unclean. I hinted at it earlier. Now I'm driving it home. All Gentile land, countries, and territories were considered unclean. Let me give you one brief example from Amos chapter 7, verse 17. It says at the last uh, section of the text, the last half, you yourself, speaking to the Jews, shall die in an unclean land. Notice God is calling a Syrian Babylon where he's about to allow the Israelites to go, unclean land. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away. From its land. The only way a Gentile could have become clean is by becoming a Jewish proselyte. And, he, and would, um, sorry, let, 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 let me rewind and come again. My eyes just <laughs> skip a line here. The only way a, a Gentile could have become clean is by becoming a Jewish proselyte and eventually get circumcised and then keep the entire Torah. This is the only way Gentiles could become clean. They had to be initiates into the covenant, learn about the Jewish rules and regulations and the principles. After they go through all of that process, then they make up their minds to get circumcised, to remove the foreskin, yes? Like what the Judaizers were trying to make the Galatians do, why Paul had to write the book of Galatians. And then when they are circumcised, they are considered to be Jews now. They are under the law now. They are under Torah now. And therefore, they are clean and they can worship with Jews in the temple. They have access to the land. They have access to the temple. They can inherit things in the land. And they are considered to be clean and God's people. This is the only way Jews could, uh, Gentiles could have become clean. But outside of this, they were considered to be in a perpetual state of uncleanness. 
their lands and countries were considered to be unclean, unkosher. And this here, brothers and sisters, uh, and the main reason for their uncleanness was primarily because of their diet. Now let me punch it. This is the background to the New Testament passages about diets and foods. When you read Romans 14 and Mark chapter 7 and Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 15 and Peter with the vision let down, etc. This is the backdrop for those passages and contentions between Jews and Gentiles about food. And this is why they are so revolutionary. Jesus removes the food distinctions. And Gentiles cannot be judged by their diets anymore. Both Jews and Gentile believers now, irrespective of their diets, are clean brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish I had a pulpit so I could preach right now, but I'm teaching so I can preach. <laughs> brothers and sisters, this is why the food rules in the New Testament is so revolutionary. This is why Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and Peter going to eat in his house and it caused such a big contention with the Jewish believers. Why it was so revolutionary? They said, we, we, we heard that you, you went with uncircumcised Gentiles and you ate with them. Eating with them meant that Peter was eating exactly what Cornelius was eating. Not only was Cornelius perpetually unclean and his house was unclean, but also the food that he was eating was naturally unclean, even if it was a clean animal. Remember, as, a, as an unclean Gentile, whatever he touches become unclean. And that's why Jews were completely separated as best as possible from Gentiles. They did not want anything from Gentiles to separate them, to make them unclean. And therefore, they have to go through that long ritual before they can become clean. This provides the background as to why in John chapter 18 and 19, brothers and sisters, and in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well, that I'm the chief priest and the Jewish leaders, they would not enter into Pilate's judgment hall. Because if they had entered into a Gentile's residence, which was unclean, they would be unclean and therefore they can't eat of the Passover. Brothers and sisters, can I teach you all right now? Can I teach you all right about now? Can I drop some theological bombs and help you make sense of scripture on these issues? This is why when you read Pilate's interaction with Jesus and the chief priest, we have Pilate being the messenger. He goes and he interrogates Jesus. After he gets response from Jesus, he exits the judgment hall and he goes outside where the Jewish people and the chief priests were to communicate to them what he said to Jesus and what Jesus responded and what they say to him he take back to Jesus and he's back and forth between them and Jesus why because those Jews could not enter into Pilate a Gentile's house and judgment hall because they would be defiled they would be unclean and therefore they could not Eat of the Passover lamb. They could not keep the feast, brothers and sisters. That's why they couldn't do it. But what Jesus has done, hallelujah. Jesus has declared all foods clean according to Mark 7, 23. And when we read Acts chapter 10, God tells Peter, what I have cleansed, do not call any man is able to call common or unclean. Cornelius and his entire house was unclean. But God has shown Peter as a result of Calvary. The Old Testament is gone. These ceremonies are gone. And now these Gentiles cannot be called unclean any longer by virtue of their diets. And that's why Peter can enter into their house and eat with them without a problem. God had removed the distinction. He had removed the separation. And now, Paul could have said in Romans 14, 14, I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that no food is unclean in and of itself, but to anyone who considers something to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And in verse 20, he could have said in the Greek, panta men kathara, meaning all foods are clean. 
Brothers and sisters, this is why it's so revolutionary. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 4 can say, we could just pray over it, bless and eat it because every creature of God is good. Nothing is existentially unclean. Jesus has broken down that middle wall of separation that the dietary rules had created. And he now brings together both Jews and Gentiles as one in himself. And he creates a new man. Brothers and sisters, this is the biblical perspective of the food rules of scripture. Jesus has removed the distinctions. Us Gentiles can't be judged by our diets any longer. Both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, you name it, are now clean brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we eat or do not eat does not matter. These are the facts of the Old Testament on the food rules. And now when you read the Old Testament, when you read the New Testament as well and, and the food issues, you can make better sense of it. You can better appreciate it. Because where the old covenant was concerned, what you ate made you unclean perpetually. Where you lived, if you're outside of the land of Israel and you're a Gentile, you're not circumcised, you are automatically unclean. <laughs> if I may just go a little deeper with y'all, man. Y'all remember in 2 Kings chapter 5 when, when Naaman after he got his healing and he, he asked Elijah for two donkey loads of dirt from Israel that he may take back to Syria to worship God? That's because the land of Syria is unclean. It is Gentile territory. It belonged to a different God. And he, under that system, could not worship God on unclean ground. And so he carries two mule loads of dirt from the Holy Land, clean dirt, to put uh, in Syria to create an altar and stand on holy dirt whereby he can worship God. You know what? Let, 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 let me end this. Let me end this. Y'all you're, you're causing my mind to go crazy with all of the information and facts now. And I don't want to go on a minute longer on this issue. Y'all get the message. Y'all get the message. These are the facts on the Old Testament. Food rules, brothers and sisters. And that's why it's so revolutionary. What Jesus has done for us in abolishing them, in removing them, and taking them out of the way. To the point now, our diets don't matter. What you choose to eat, whether it is for medical reasons, whether it is for cultural reasons, uh, whether it is for, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. It's your personal choice. What you choose to eat, and none of this affects your salvation. None of it, brothers and sisters. And that is the end of the matter. So thank you very much for another wonderful study, brothers and sisters. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you can pass this on to some um, Adventists who may need enlightenment on this issue, who may be bombarding you with their lopsided, half-baked food rules issue. And hopefully they can be liberated as they investigate the biblical and historical facts on these issues. Thank you very much. God bless y'all. I'm happy for all of you who stayed on to watch this presentation. And those of you on YouTube who will watch it, don't forget to go on my channel, subscribe, like, leave a comment, recommendation, whatever. Uh, help me grow the channel. Help, help get the word out so that others can be blessed by these presentations as well. So brothers and sisters, y'all take good care. It was my pleasure serving you another wonderful meal from the Word of God. It was my pleasure deconstructing another aspect of SDA theology for you. And I'm happy that you enjoyed it. Those of you who are just coming on, you may need to watch the whole thing when I finish. Or you could check it out on YouTube when I upload it. But watch it for yourself. If after you watch it, you think I still have this completely wrong, I am clueless as to what I'm talking about, and these food rules are still binding on Christians today, then please, I, I always invite you all, fact check me. I invite you all to refute what I present. I invite you all to engage me in dialogue on these issues. 
And if after you thoroughly present your case and I see that you have the correct perspective and argument on the historical facts, I have no problem in, in recounting what I just presented and to accept your view. But for now, this is where it's at. I know what you believe. I've, I, I used to believe it. I thoroughly investigated it. As a Bible scholar, I could do my own work, which I've done, and I've presented the facts, and this is where I'm at. So if you think you got something different that's going to present something different than what I presented, then let's do it. But for now, I want to take care. God bless you all, and I'll catch you all another time for another episode of Deconstructing Adventism. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. God bless you all.